Hello, welcome to Illinois Stories. I'm Mark McDonald in Springfield at the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Museum, where it's all pretty normal around here except for one addition this summer and going into next year. In this great struggle, the greatest generation remembers World War II, and when you get into the exhibit hall, you will notice that times have changed. Mark Depew, it's a remarkable exhibit, and it's, it's very timely because just this summer was the 75th anniversary of the D-Day invasion that was well celebrated, but this exhibit, if people don't see this, they're not gonna get the true feel for it. No, and what we wanted to do with this exhibit is really get a sense, you said the greatest generation, and that's what it's about. It's about everybody in that generation, whether they were at home, working in a factory, yeah. or they were had their own little victory garden, or whatever the case may be, and the GI experience itself. So it was about all of them, and it's about the average person in that war. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting way to get into this exhibit. The entrance takes you right to the end of a troop carrying ship en uh, entering the beaches at D-Day. So let's you and I walk in and take okay. this experience together, okay? Well, for all those people who are military minded, it's a land and craft vehicle personnel, otherwise known as a Higgins boat. A Higgins and it boat. should okay. automatically open. And as you can see, we're landing in Omaha Beach. Machine guns under fire. Uh, splashes in the water where the bullets are hitting, smoke in the background. They've never done anything like this before in an exhibit, and I think they went overboard on this. Not overboard, they, they outdid themselves on this. It's, you, you, it's, could, you almost get the feeling for what it would be like uh, to look into the yeah. mist and not be able to see where you're going and only hear gunshots coming yeah. at you. And I'm a bit disappointed that not everybody stands here for a minute and kind of takes it all in. They just take yeah. that corner too yeah. quickly, I think, sometimes. Yeah. And you need to get that effect, that impact of what it must have really been like. I can those. hear the shots. I yeah. can hear the shots. You almost feel them landing in the water next to you. You bet. Well, when we turn left here, we said in this struggle, or <clears throat> in, in this, this great struggle, Abraham Lincoln's words. Yeah. And this is reflected as the first thing you see here. And if I'll just read it real quickly. In this great struggle, this form of government and every form of human right endangered if our enemies succeed. And you start to think about, here's a quote that he's given to a bunch of Civil War veterans, but it was every bit as true for the United States. Our country, our way of life was at stake. Mm -hmm. And that's the connection we wanted with, with Abraham Lincoln. Great artifacts here. This is actually a piece of one of the helmets that was found on the beaches. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Can you imagine digging around in the sand and suddenly encountering this oh. years later? It would really would make your blood curdle uh, because you, you, you start to think about what the person had gone through that lost his helmet yeah. in that experience. And then just to the right, of course, these flags, the, all of these landing ships, um, everyone, of course, had a flag and they were crossing all the time. So yeah. these flags were getting beat up by the, by the, by the winds over the, yeah. the North Pacific, or the North Atlantic. Yeah, this one was on a landing ship tank, an LST, which is the workhorse. These are the kind of ships that were flat bottom and could drive right onto mm -hmm. the beach and open up its bay doors and then the tanks and the trucks would drive right off. But they were going back and forth across the channel and, you know, after you do that so many times in that rough weather, this is what happens to the flags. Flag makers would have been very busy. Utah Beach, we like to think of beaches as sandy. This was a tough go, this Utah Beach, and you can see this picture of these GIs getting dragged up on this beach, injured already, yeah. more injured after they got dragged over all these rocks. Well, a GI landed a few days after the main landings. I mean, they kept coming into these beaches for weeks afterwards. Mm -hmm. He picked up this stone and he carried it in his pocket for the rest of the war. Just to remind him, yeah. just to remind him. Oh. There were a lot of guys who, uh, the the day before the invasion landed, Eisenhower had written this very poignant speech and he had issued it to everybody and then they heard him give it as well. A lot of the veterans folded that up, put it in their billfolds, they mm -hmm. saved it for the entire war as well. Look at how busy, busy, busy this is. Remarkable. Yeah, and that's what you're seeing here on the, uh, the uh, line with the um, shore there are those LSTs that mm -hmm. are disgorging their, their their goods. Mm -hmm. they, they carried troops and tanks and ammunition, didn't they? They carried, they carried everything. everything. Mm -hmm. They carried everything. Talk about a theater of war. When you talk about the theater, you, you don't really get that feeling until you see a wide shot like this, which shows you all that must go on. Well, and you're looking in the background and you're seeing all of the ships that are out there in the, in the distance. And think of this here, Mark. They built two harbors for the D-Day landings. They had them built in England. They hauled them over. And a lot of them, the, uh, the 
the breakwaters were sunken ships, but because of the mammoth scale, and they knew they weren't going to have a harbor mm -hmm. for a few months, mm -hmm. they built their own harbors and oh, took yeah. it with them. And they had to do all this with some secrecy. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, because yeah. if, once Hitler finds out, it's they're not coming aboard. They're yeah. not coming ashore. Okay, re really, the greatest generation is what this is about. And this part of the exhibit that we're going to see next is about what the people, not only the soldiers, but the people back home were doing, because nobody was unaffected. Yeah, and that's very much what we wanted to stress, to emphasize that everybody had had something to gain in this thing. Mm -hmm. They wanted to pull their weight, they wanted to participate and be part of this this endeavor. Mm -hmm. um, ever since you have the, the Pearl Harbor attack, like no other time in American history, Americans were united in mm -hmm. this one. Mm -hmm. And so the first couple parts of this, that we broke it up, once we get beyond this introductory portion, we broke it up into four basic parts. And the first one is home front. And as we go through here, you're going to see lots of these World War II era posters. And we had a comment that says, well, these are way too pristine. These obviously weren't from that time. No, these are the actual <laughs> artifacts, those That's posters. Right. And as you go through, we, as much as possible, try to link the, the, the posters with the story that we're telling. Uh -huh. And in this part, it's about the home front. Mm -hmm. So here you've got uh, a woman with this blue star flag behind her shoulder here. We're looking over here to the left here with this, and we're asking, she's asking, please give my boy a chance to get home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what's the blue star about? If you had a son or more than one, you had that flag in your living room window telling everybody in the neighborhood you were proud that you're playing I, I your part. I didn't know that. I'd never heard that before. Yeah. But that was, okay. The That's blue what star. that was all about. Okay. And, of course, war bonds were a big part of it. And you can't help but, you know, a better, a better salesman than a baby. <laughs> <laughs> and, obviously, one of the reasons we chose this one is because it's an African-American baby. But, mm -hmm. it again, illustrates, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of African-American troops in the war mm -hmm. as well. And their parents and their extended families were just as committed to success as anybody else was. Mm -hmm. uh, so you get a real sense in this particular panel, in as few words as possible, conveying the message with pictures the different ways. Like the one in the center that catches people's eye here. Which one is that? This one here? Okay. The Japanese controlled almost all of the rubber sources in the world. Oh. So there was even cases where they were making tires out of out of wood, if mm -hmm. you can imagine what kind of a bumpy mm -hmm. ride that might have been. Man. But the sacrifices they had to make. And we were talking about war bonds. Just as important were the revenue coming in from taxes, right? And so here's a poster that says, pay your taxes on time, so we need, we got to get that money. I suspect <clears throat> that they weren't any more excited about paying their taxes then than <laughs> we are today. But. Except they were motivated. They yeah, were motivated. Yeah. <laughs> and obviously the the, the tax rate went up astronomically. It was well over 90% for yeah. the highest uh, tax yeah. margins. Eisenhower was extremely popular, um, at, not only at this time but after, but uh, to use him as a, a salesman was a, was a good, was a good yeah. move too. And what do we see down here? These are the whole economy geared towards war. So the toys, they're, you know, here's a little bank that you can have, put your savings mm -hmm. in. It made to look like an artillery shell. Mm -hmm. You've got the tanks. Remember. You've got the war bond um, ration coupons mm -hmm. over here. Mm -hmm. A little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. And one of the most famous posters, we don't have it on the wall, but we've got it right here. With the Rosie the River. Rosie huh? the River. Yeah. We yeah. can do it. And, yes, our videos includes a Rosie the River. You, and we will talk about those videos because yeah. what you've yeah. you've done it really have a nice panel over here that's computerized. You can call up the videos that you mm -hmm. want, and we, and we will get there. Um, but but again, the, these posters, these were ever present. People couldn't go through a day without having seen these at some point. Yeah. And this is before television. Yeah. And this is at a time when we weren't as embarrassed about the word propaganda. This is essentially what it is. Mm -hmm. Here's the government trying to convince people to do various things that were important to the war effort. And of course, we've got uh, one of the most famous ones here, uh, Buy War Bonds, The Four Freedoms of Norman Rockwell. This is the only mm -hmm. one of the four that we have, but it, it oh, certainly speaks volumes. That is precious. Now we're getting to the next of the four major components, arsenal democracy. So this is still very much the story of what was going on at home. And here you have 
we're in the midst of depression for 10 years or mm -hmm, more, mm -hmm. and suddenly you get to World War II, and everything is turned on its head, and all these idle factories are geared up again, and as you mentioned before, suddenly you're not building automobiles, you're building tanks mm -hmm, or trucks mm -hmm. or something else for the war effort. And this panel, again, there's very few words on it, but I thought it would spoke volumes if we just say, how many aircraft do you think that we built in the war? How many ships? Here, here's a good look right here. Now, <clears throat> we were building aircraft in this country, but nothing like 300,000 of them. And we retooled, our, our whole industry retooled yeah. to build all these things, ships, aircraft, 300,000 aircraft during yeah. the war. Isn't That's that remarkable. And there's 8,000 8, warships. No other country had anywhere near this capacity, did they? No, absolutely not. And we weren't just building it for ourselves. We had the obligation to actually equip other allied nations as much as possible. Let's go well. down to the other panel, because I think that's what we see here. Yeah, the lend -lease. And how many people, I, I would hope they still teach about this in history books. It, to the British Empire, we loaned or gave $31 billion. To the Soviet Union, $11 billion. Those are $11 billion in 1940s in those dollars. dollars. Oh, it's remarkable. Remarkable. And, and all of these nations were, were recipients of our largesse um, to, a, to a lesser degree. But even China, $1.5 billion. Yeah. Of course, that was a different China. That wasn't Mao's China. That was China. the nationalist yeah. Chinese. Yeah. And again, the numbers tell the story here. We talked about the Soviet Union. To wrap your brain around that. You know, we're going to be in a Cold War with them for the next 30 years, maybe. Mm -hmm. During the war, among other things, we sent them something like 430,000 trucks, plus tanks. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. <laughs> you've noticed this yourself, the boots. 15 million pairs of boots to the, to the Soviet Union. Uh, all of this to contain Hitler on one, on one front. Right. That's, that's what we were trying to do. Wow. Yeah. And little did we know that we would become, well, we probably had an inkling we'd become nemesis, but not, not to the extent yeah. that it actually happened. And this is a population of about 140 million people. Mm -hmm. So obviously much smaller numbers in that respect from what we have yeah. today as well. And you think about the numbers that for the production, the numbers that we sent out overseas to our allies, it's just mind boggling, mm -hmm. I think. And it's, it pays to think about it a little bit and understand how much all in we, uh, we really mm -hmm, were for mm -hmm, that war. Yeah. And like this whole part of the exhibit shows, that could not have happened without everybody at home being totally, totally bought in. Exactly. Yeah. Mark, it's not every day you see one of these going down the road. But, but last spring, there was a guy from Springfield who had this Indian motorcycle. And he drove it right to the door, didn't he? <laughs> he drove it right to the door. It's in mint condition. Um, it's, this particular motorcycle was built to operate in the, in the North Africa terrain. Mm -hmm. So it has some innovations to it that were unique at the time. Uh, but it's the kind of thing where by the time they had it out of production line, they had already, the Army had moved past uh, North Africa. But mm -hmm. it's by far the most popular of the artifacts that we have here. And it's not hard to understand why. And it's a Springfield man who owned this and kept it in this kind yeah. of condition. And it's on loan here for this. Yes. Uh, after this exhibit's over, he's going to take it back and ride it around yeah. town again. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Well, the first thing we had to do, obviously, when oh, we get here is to, to drain the fluids out of it mm -hmm. to make it safe. Oh, but beautiful. he drove it here. Now, how cool is that? It is cool. And look, He's got a leather saddle. He's got all the leather, uh, the, the outfits. Look where his Thompson submachine gun on the front would be right at his right hand if he needed it. Yeah. And of course, what's interesting there, the Thompson submachine gun, Americans would have known about that by watching all these gangster movies in mm -hmm. the 1930s, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. <laughs> and we've got the two rifles here that would have been the most uh, prolific, the ones that the soldiers mostly used, the, mm -hmm. the Springfield and the 1903 Springfield and the M1 Garand. Mm -hmm. Around the corner we've got carbines and, and the submachine gun over here, but yeah. a little bit of the flavor of the, the weapons, yeah. and these are always popular things for the public to see as well, yeah. to understand what, was, what it was really mm -hmm. like for the GI's mm -hmm. side of the story. And that kind of illustrates we are now in what we call the GI experience portion of the exhibit. And this is if they really want to immerse themselves into what these, what these uh, experiences would have been, that's what this computerized board is for and this huge video uh, board here. Um, if they want to see 
the Battle of the Bulge, they can press tap on that and it'll queue up and that'll be the next feature. That'll be the And next these are feature. all narrated, right? Yeah, the, there are 21 videos altogether and this is really where I got involved with it since I'm the oral historian and the vast majority of these are people that I've actually interviewed. So each one of these illustrate a particular battle or event of the war and it illustrates one of the people that we've interviewed. So we put some narration to kind of set things up on the event a little bit of narration about telling you who we're talking about in that one, and then you get to hear their own voice talking about mm -hmm. these experiences. Um, everything from Pearl Harbor, and we have Charles Sehe talking about being on the USS Nevada at Pearl Harbor Day. Mm -hmm. His battle station was up in the searchlight, so he's high up in the mast watching mm -hmm. the battle wow. transpire in front of him, and he has some incredible memories of that experience. Uh, we have uh, Rosie the Riveter, we have a woman who worked in the Office of Price Administration, we've got the anti-submarine warfare, obviously D-Day, Battle of Midway, mm -hmm. Battle of the Bulge, discovering the death camps. Every one of those is illustrated by one of these three to five minute videos and they've been very well received. People kind of park down here and they, they take their seats and what's supposed to look like these uh, reconfigured ammunition boxes from the war and they'll watch several of them. And that's heartwarming for us I'll to bet. put all that work into it. I'll but it, this is really the heart of telling the GI story in, in those little vignettes and hearing them, them talk about it in person. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The surprise attack on the Pacific Fleet that Sunday morning crippled the once proud Pacific Fleet. Seventeen ships were damaged that day, including eight battleships sunk or severely damaged. More jarring to Americans, however, were the 2,403 countrymen who lost their lives. Illinois native, Seaman Charles Sahey, was fresh out of Navy boot camp at Great Lakes Naval Training Center when he was sent to the USS Nevada in late 1940, then birthed in Bremerton, Washington. One year later, on December 7th, the USS Nevada was anchored along Battleship Row in Pearl Harbor. Say he was in the enlisted man's head when the attack began. I had breakfast. At 7.30, I went to the head. After head, washed up. Then uh, the four or five of us in the head, uh, sitting, sitting around, and all of a sudden, the jar, the boom. I said, oh, that they're practicing firing in the harbor, they're shooting, we thought. So then I ran to my battle station, and oh my God, it's going unbelievable, unbelievable. I never fully understood the feeling, the shock. Uh, what, what the hell is happening? Who are they? The events of December 7th haunt Sehi to this day. He found it much easier to write down his memories than to speak about them. Here is his account of what happened next. I ran to my battle station, which was number four after searchlight, located high up on the main mast. Already incoming Japanese planes were strafing the exposed deck areas with machine gun bullets, and the color guard and band members were scattering for safety. All I could do was watch this terrible, alarming, unbelievable nightmare unfold before my eyes. An aerial torpedo launched from one of the Japanese planes soon struck in the Nevada on the port side, causing the ship to lurch violently upward and shudder. The Nevada, with some of its boilers already lit on standby, got up enough steam pressure to get underway. As the ship slowly eased its way into the channel, passing the Arizona, a tremendous fiery explosion ripped the Arizona apart, showering the open deck crews of the Nevada with hot, searing metallic debris, burning many of them to their death. I watched a second wave of high-level and dive bombers now concentrating their efforts on the Nevada as we slowly proceeded up the channel and heard cheers coming from the crews of other ships encouraging us onward. Although there were many near misses indicated by numerous waterspouts, numerous bombs made their mark, 
and severely damaged the forecastle, bridge, and the boat deck area. The Nevada was given orders to beach itself so as to avoid blocking the channel to prevent other ships from entering or leaving. As the Nevada passed by a dry dock, the destroyer, Shaw, moored nearby, blew up by a direct hit, showering the decks of the Nevada. Mark, we talked earlier about how everybody was connected and, un and nobody was unaffected by the war. And one of the biggest things that you could do to keep that connection going was to make sure that the letters from the GIs could get back and forth to their families and the families could contact them. Because hope was a big thing. You had to have hope. And th that mail was a, was a very, very oh, important. Mail call was maybe the most important event that they would have in a typical day is making sure if you got a, a letter from home or a package from home that was everything mm -hmm. then you'd go off to your corner someplace and catch up with what's going on how did home. they get it back and forth well one of the ways they did it a very innovative way they they developed this v-mail concept where you would have this standard card that you would write your message on then you'd give it to somebody in the government they would take a picture of it they would put it on this this microfilm stick it in this container, put it in a duffel bag, throw it on an aircraft that's mm -hmm. flying overseas. So rather than going on a slow boat someplace that maybe takes a month, if it yeah. didn't get sunk, you've got your letter in a day or two. And wow. they had to reverse the process once they got to theater. Yeah, yeah. And th 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 they had to have a whole division of, of people just to do this. Yeah. But they had to be done. It had to be done. And telegrams were another way that information got, got sent. And it wasn't always pleasant. If yeah, one of the worst things that a parent might feel is seeing that, uh, that Western Union uh, delivery boy riding his bicycle up to the door and then knocking on the door, and he's saying, your heart would sink because what message might they have? There, there's a local man named Dick Lockhart who's been working in the state capitol for decades and decades. A lot of people know him. This is a picture of him as a GI. And he was originally thought, to, well, he was missing in action. That's what at, the first telegram at said. At the Battle of the Bulge, he was uh, one of the people who was at, captured very early in the battle. His parents got a letter saying he was missing in action. Mm -hmm. And, of course, you know, mind races and what the possibilities might be. There's another Western Union that came and they said, no, 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 he's not. He's, he's actually a prisoner of war, which is not good news, but it's better than missing in action. At least you're alive, yeah. right? And then your heart races again because you get another telegram saying that, no, no, we've, we've, we've located him. He's out. He's oh. under American control. Yeah, yeah. And then, as you mentioned here, the last of the telegrams, he's coming home. <laughs> oh, man. And we oh. have one of the videos is on him, <laughs> and he's telling the story about his going to the POW camp on a train and being strafed and bombed mm -hmm. by American aircraft because mm -hmm. they're not marked in any special yeah. way. Oh, my goodness. What an experience. And of course, man's best friend always was, was a factor, um, not only in everyday life, but in everyday war life as well. And, and this is interesting because we have the dogs, Duke's dog tags here. There's a picture of Duke and there's his dog tags. And they were important, weren't they? They were, they had a variety of different missions, uh, delivering messages, because they could do that much more quickly oftentimes, a little bit of intelligence work. Mm -hmm. In this case, the unfortunate part, the poignant part, is Duke is killed in action at Iwo Jima. Oh, man. But here's, this is another one of our more popular exhibits. I'll bet it is. I'll bet it is. Well, yeah. you know, it's an eye-opener. People don't, they think they know all about, uh, about war, but I, nobody, unless you've been there, you don't know. Exactly. exactly. And, and over here, we talked about Iwo Jima. Here's, here's some of the very sand from that beach, which is, you can almost reach out and touch it. Yeah. This is uh, Warren Mush. He was an intelligence officer at Iwo Jima. He landed on the far left side of the beach because his regiment had the, ch had the task of taking Mount Suribachi. Mm. And here's the dungaree he wore Oh wow! at Iwo Jima. And when I did the interview with him, he was wearing that dungaree. No kidding. But I tell you, I've ran into several of the Marines I've interviewed who have their own little vial of sand from Iwo Jima. That's how meaningful that is to them. Mm -hmm. And right behind us as we close, I wish we could see the whole exhibit, right behind us as we close here we see this iconic photograph of Iwo Jima and the flag being raised and this is sort of where you recommend people finish the exhibit. Yeah, I mean the, the photo is the most famous photo of World War II. Yeah. I think the only one that might challenge that in terms of American memory is the one where the 
the sailor is kissing the nurse in New York City on VJ Day. Uh -huh. And we have one of our videos is two women talking about both getting kissed on VJ Day. That's is that kinda, right? Okay, so it wasn't that rare. It's just that the <laughs> photographer didn't catch every time. Yeah. And, um, and this is interesting because the legacy of the greatest generation finishes up this exhibit. And, and this is interesting when you look at all that it begat you know, from, yeah. from uh, all the war. For you know, there's, there's a plus sign, there's a downside, but I think most historians, and certainly I feel like, there is so much of the positive that that greatest generation gave to us. Now, you and I are both of an age where we are part of that legacy, mm -hmm. we're part of the baby boom generation, but interstate highway system, the Marshall Plan in terms of rebuilding Europe and Asia afterwards. I've got this picture of the Nuremberg trial, but that's to emphasize that we brought democracy and rule of law to these two countries that we had defeated, Germany and Japan. Mm -hmm. And think about where they are today. That's part of the legacy of World War II. Um, you've got a large standing military uh, afterwards, and one of these pictures, it's got Elvis over here, I think. We do, right on the, on the sworn end. Sworn in after he's been drafted <laughs> into the Army. So <laughs> thought that might be a good way the to The United Nations that right above it, of course. Absolutely. And you mentioned the Nuremberg trials. There, there's a picture of the courtroom. And once you've got interstate highways and you have this huge growth of, of suburban areas and a, that building boom afterwards because that had been all repressed for about a decade during the Great Depression. And all these GIs are coming home and they want a piece of the American dream. So they want that family. They want that comfortable home. Mm -hmm. They want to get settle down, marry, they go to school on the GI Bill. Mm -hmm. It's all part of that legacy that we still have and that look back yeah. at today. Mark DePew, thank you for this guided tour. It's been terrific. Thank you for uh, taking the opportunity. Yeah. And I would hope that people get excited and actually come down and check it out because uh, it's think, worth it. I think they will. Thank you very much. You bet. Well, this uh, exhibit, uh, which features the greatest generation and, of course, World War II, is at the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Museum and it is included in your ticket to the museum. With another Illinois story in Springfield, I'm Mark McDonald. Thanks for watching. Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Illinois Arts Council Agency, and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you.